Hello, everybody. Yes, it's me, Georgia May Mossholder, back with Billy Graham's book about the Heaven Answer book. And we got up to the place it says, What happens when we die? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's Psalms 23, verses 4 and 6. Why must we die? Death is the penalty for sin, and because we are all infected with the disease of sin, we are all subject to death. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, verse 23. Death was never part of God's original plan. God told Adam and Eve, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it you will surely die. That's Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. There was nothing magical about the tree, but God had every right to withhold it from Adam and Eve and shield them from the knowledge of evil. But Satan was determined to make what was forbidden look attractive to Adam and Eve. The sin they committed was disobedience to God. And in time, they died. As God had warned Satan's lies that they would be like God, overpowered them and made them forget all the provisions God had graciously given them. Genesis 3, verses 5 to 7. This is the sin that saturates our hearts to this day, to believe Satan's deceitful lies instead of res respecting and honoring God's gracious gifts. Death is the common lot of every living thing, people, plants, and animals. Death afflicts all creation. From the moment a child is born, the dying process and the fight against it begins. But God, in his great love, made it possible for us to have victory over death, in spite of the fact that we must walk through it. The Bible tells us that death cannot separate believers in Jesus Christ from the love of God. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. The Bible also says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. For the Lord is your life. Deuteronomy 30 verses 19 and 20. The death of the righteous is not to be feared or shunned. It is the shadowed threshold to heaven, the place, palace of God. Well, why are we afraid to die? We are afraid to die because we cannot see beyond this present world. Death reduces all of us to the same rank. It strips the rich of their millions and the poor of their rags. Death knows no age limits, no partiality. It is that which all men fear. For some, it is the process of dying that is so frightful. Even the most devout are susceptible to this fear. King David said, Terrors of death assail me. Psalms 55 verse 4. The disciples cried out to the Lord, Save us! We're going to drown! Matthew 8, verse 25. For others, it is the uncertainty of what happens after they die. So that death carries what it is, what it, so that death carries with it a sense of dread. It is the enemy, the great mysterious monster that makes people quake with fear. Yet, yeah, when it came time for David to die, he expressed assurance of the afterlife and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ 
that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. Acts 2, verse 31. The disciples, who had once feared death on the Sea of Galilee, crisscrossed the world, proclaiming that death had been swallowed up in victory because of, the, of Christ's resurrection. Why live in a sea of despair when you can live knowing that, after death, life can be experienced as it was originally intended, in fellowship with our Creator and our Lord? This is the confidence that Christians possess. Death marks the beginning of a new and wonderful life in heaven with Christ that will last forever. To the believer, death is merely the gateway to eternal life, where underneath are the everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. I've got it. Okay. How do we know our souls won't be trapped in our bodies when we die? Well, there's one very good reason. God has promised to take us to himself when we die. The Bible says, We know that if the earthly tent we live in, our body, is destroyed, we have a building from God in an, an eternal house in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 Jesus said our souls which are his very creation, are more valuable to him than all the rest of the world put together. The Bible teaches us that our bodies are flesh and bone and they will die eventually, but that we also are immortal, eternal souls. The soul, or spirit, includes our conscience as well as the part of us that thinks and feels and dreams. It will never die but will live forever in either heaven or hell. Most of all, through our souls we can know God and have fellowship with him. When God created Adam, he formed his body from the dust of the ground. That body was not living until God breathed into it the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 2 verse 7. When a person dies, the body gives up the ravages of age and disease to decay. But the spirit, the soul, returns to its maker. Dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Ecclesiastics 12, verse 7. Paul declared that to be in heaven is to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Have you ever wanted to go somewhere, but you were just too tired? Your body stays home, but your thoughts are where you wish you could be? This is a picture of the separation of body and soul. The body will be buried in the earth, awaiting the final resurrection, but the soul will be in God's care. We may spend all of our time pampering our bodies, but if we ignore our souls, we will end up spiritually starved. While we're here, we must take care of our souls and God's treasure by feeding on the word of God, for our soul is the only thing we can take out of our earthly experience to heaven. Are we immediately with the Lord in heaven when we die? Or, or do we have a time of soul sleep before we go into God's presence? Well, the Bible teaches to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. The Apostle Paul, writing in the midst of his struggles in prison, yearned for the glories that awaited him when his body would be killed and he would be in the Lord's presence. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Philippians 1, 23. The Apostle John had a different experience in prison. When he was given a vision of heaven, he described the glimpse, glimpse he had of the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. Revelation 6, verse 9. 
These were Christian martyrs, and John heard them crying out and asking when the Lord would avenge their blood. John heard the voice say to them, Rest a little while longer. Verse Chapter 6, verse 11. Here's a picture of souls at rest in the presence of God. While their bodies are still in the grave awaiting the final resurrection, God's Spirit comforts their spirits because He is the God of all comfort. Jesus said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mark twelve twenty seven. One of the comforts of being a Christian is the glorious hope that extends beyond the grave into the glory of God's tomorrow. As Jesus declared to the repentant criminal who was crucified with him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, verse 43. Emphasis added, today. (laughs) Do angels accompany the dead to heaven? We actually have a glimpse of this in the story Jesus told of the rich man and the beggar named Lazarus. When the beggar died, Jesus said, The angels carried him to Abram's ham's side, another term for heaven. Luke 16, verse 22. Many counts tell of dying saints being at peace because of this angelic presence. The Lord is the God of all comfort, and he employs his heavenly army of angels to bring warnings of danger, tidings of joy, and messages of peace. The Bible calls them ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. That's Hebrews 1, 14. Believing that God will send these angelic comforters to escort us out of this world and into the next should give great peace to our souls. The Bible says, The Lord shall preserve your soul. He shall preserve your going out and your coming in. Psalms 121, verses 7 and 8. But we must remember, however, that while God's angels provide comfort and protection, even at death, it is God who dispatches them, and we are not to worship them. For example, consider the exchange between John and an angel in Revelation. The apostle was so overwhelmed with the grandeur of heaven that he fell at the feet of the angel to worship him. The angel spoke and said, Do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Revelation 22 verse 9. Scripture clearly condemns the worship of angels. Colossians 2, verse 18. Only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is worthy of our praise and worship. What is Jesus' role in heaven? Christ is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, where he is interceding on our behalf. What exactly does this mean? The Bible says that God appointed his only son, Jesus, as heir of all things. And when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand hand of the majesty on high, Hebrews 1 verse 3, as our high priest and advocate, the Bible says we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, 1 John 2, verse 1. We may slip into sin, but we won't slip out of his hand. What a promise for believers. When one of his own stumbles, Jesus tells his father, Oh, he repented, and I have forgiven him. Or perhaps he says, Father, that dear lady belongs to me. Her sins are covered by my blood. Jesus is the heir of heaven. And as his children, we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Romans eight seventeen. Jesus prayed, I have given them the glory that you gave me, 
May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me. John 17, verses 22 and 23. While Christ reserves our space in heaven, our eternal life was won through his work at Calvary. Our acceptance in heaven, then, must be determined on earth through repenting of sin and receiving Christ as our Savior and our Lord. From heaven, the Lord also observes what is happening on earth. Just before Stephen died, he looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen's accusers heard him say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Acts seven fifty five through 59 Stephen fell to the ground under the barrage of stones and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he fell asleep. Verse 60 What conversation there must have been between father and son. No book is large enough to give a full account of Jesus' work. John 21, verse 25 what matters most is that his work is complete and our role in heaven will be to glorify him for what he has accomplished. We will marvel when we hear the rest of his story. What are the benefits of death to believers? Well, the greatest benefit is that we, be, we will be free from all the pains and sorrows, evils of this life, and we will be safely in God's presence forever. When we purchased life insurance, the benefit package determines the cost of the policy, and the insured must die in order for the life insurance policy to be paid. If you think about it, the same sort of transaction occurred at Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. No matter how wealthy a person may be, only one could pay the cost of eternal life. And the benefits are guaranteed and held in the treasury of hope. The policy owner is the Lord Jesus Christ. The cost was his life blood to redeem us from sin. The fully paid benefit is our assurance of eternal life in God's kingdom, redeemable to those who exchange a sinful heart for a forgiven heart. When those souls pass from death to new life, the face of faith of the things they hope for is clearly seen. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 12, verse 34. God outlines his benefit packages in his will for us. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up. John 6, verse 40. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. John fourteen twenty one. I should say emphasis added was on the word will. When I speak a loud word, that's when they're emphasizing. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2, 7, emphasis added. I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, 10, emphasis added. I will write on him the name of my God. Revelation 3, 12, emphasis added. I will Give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Revelation 21, 6. Emphasis added. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Revelation 21, 7. Emphasis added. So, unlike the insurance policies we purchased the greatest benefit received at a believer's death is not found in the small print, but in the nail prints 
in Jesus' hands. Does God forbid cremation? Scripture teaches that we are to honor the body because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 In Bible times, burial was the common practice because it was seen as a sign of respect. When cremation was practiced, it, was, it showed contempt for the person. Joshua 7.25 Today, cremation is often practiced in cultures that have no respect for the human body as God's creation, which usually leads Christians in those societies to reject cremation. God gave us our bodies, and when he saw all he had made, it was very good. Genesis 1, 31. While cremation is becoming more accepted among Christian todays, burial, laying a body to rest in the earth, has been the preferred method as an act of respect for God's creation. It also reflects the great care that was given to the Lord's body after his death. Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. Our hearts are touched when we read in Scripture how the women went to the tomb on that first Easter morning, hoping to anoint his body, only to find the tomb empty and an angel announcing his resurrection. Mark 16, verses 1 through 7. One day we will stand before the Lord in heaven, for our bodies will also be resurrected. This doesn't mean that bodies disposed of in other ways, whether buried at sea or burned as martyrs at the stake or Human ashes scattered across hills and valleys won't be res resurrected. The Bible says he will send his angels to gather all people from the four winds from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Mark 13, verse 27. Abraham said, I am nothing but dust and ashes. Genesis 18, verse 27. The Bible tells us the first man was of the dust of the earth. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. We should honor the earthly tent of our dwelling when it is in our power to do so. For the physical body is the work of his hands. But take comfort that God is able to bring together whatever has been scattered. What does it mean to be changed in the twinkling of an eye? In the Greek language, the twinkling of an eye implies only half a wink, and that is the expression Paul used to describe how quickly God will transform our bodies at the resurrection. In the computer age, users, users do not question the nanosecond, one billionth of a second, the unit of time it often takes a computer to access its memory. A person can begin to type a phrase, and before he or she is finished, it will appear on the screen. Yet many people doubt that God can transform his creation in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible tells us that at the end of the present age, one generation of believers will never know bodily death, namely the generation that is still alive when Christ returns for his own. Jesus told the disciples during their last hours together before his death that he was going away. He then said, I will come back and take you to be with me. John 14, 3. This event is called the rapture. They will then join with believers from throughout the ages in the final resurrection. The instant when our Mortal bodies will be transformed into the likeness of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 
verses 51 and 52. The dust that returned to the earth in death, in death will become heaven-bound life with Christ in the twinkling of an eye. Well, what is a resurrected body? Resurrected bodies are physical bodies reunited with the spirit, soul, but without imperfections or weaknesses. As such, they will be like the resur resurrected body of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the resurrection, the fleshly physical body that was prone to wander in sin will become a glorious spirit-filled body set free from sin. Just as we have become the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven, Christ. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 49 and 53. The body that lies decaying in the grave may have been worn out with age, abused by disease or harm, or broken by an accident. But in the resurrection, that body will be raised in glory. Our limited minds cannot begin to fathom what will transpire, transpire in that moment. But we do know that our resurrected bodies will be free of all infirmities and will know nothing of physical weaknesses. Limitations imposed on this earth are not known in heaven. We will have a habitation from God that is incorruptible, immortal, and powerful, having been sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 43. We may not be able to comprehend this now, but our bodies and our minds, our understanding, will be illuminated by Christ. Scripture does not teach that we will be given a second body, but a new body, the same body that we walked around in on earth, only transformed, bearing the likeness of Christ. We don't have that kind of body now, but the old will pass away and the new will come. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. This principle, applied to the sinner's new life at the time of salvation, also looks forward to our new life in heaven. Sin is defeated by Christ's sacrifice, and death is defeated by Christ's resurrection. The promise of eternal life on earth is fulfilled in the reality of heaven. Who will be included in the resurrection of the dead? Jesus taught that both the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected. When Jesus spoke to those who were persecuting him, persecuting him, he said, A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. John 5, verses 28 and 29. Those who have received Christ will live with him forever. Those who rejected Christ will live in eternity separated from him. This is a grim reality. But God's grace is also a reality. God died for all sinners. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. The Bible says that he was despised and rejected by men. Isaiah 55, 3. But in his grace, he desires that all receive the salvation extended them to them by his outstretched arms on the cross. Death is, is not the end for anyone, no matter who we are. We live on in heaven with God or in that place of absolute hopelessness the Bible calls hell. It is unbelief that shuts the door to heaven and opens the one to hell. It is unbelief that rejects the word of God and refuses Christ as Savior. It is unbelief that causes men to turn deaf ears to the gospel. Only one answer will give a person 
the certain privilege of entering heaven. I have believed in Jesus Christ and accepted him as my Savior. These are the bodies that will be raised in glory, power, and victory. What is purgatory? And are some people sent there before they enter heaven? Scripture gives no account of and does not support the idea of purgatory, the idea developed in medieval times, and the purpose was to designate a place where those who had died were sent to be purified from sin. But this would discount the work of Christ on the cross. The Bible says, When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Colossians 2.13, emphasis added. The Apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, wrote, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were all we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Romans 5, verses 8 and 9. God's wrath toward sin has been satisfied fully and completely on the cross. This man, Jesus, offered one sacrifice for sins forever. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10, verses 12 and 14. Nothing can make us more righteous in God's sight than we already are through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. By his death and resurrection, he purchased our salvation fully and completely. Why would a loving God send anyone to hell? If you think about it, people actually send themselves to hell through their rebellion and unbelief in Jesus Christ. But let me assure you, Christ doesn't want us to go there. The subject of heaven is much easier for us to accept than the subject of hell. Yet the Bible teaches both. It may surprise you to discover that no one taught about or warned us against hell more than Jesus. And we should take his words very seriously. Some teach that everyone will eventually be saved because a God of love would never send anyone to hell. They contend that words like eternal and everlasting do not actually mean forever. However, the same word in the Bible that speaks of eternal banishment from God in hell is also used to describe the eternal bliss of heaven. What is hell? The Bible gives us several vivid images, such as calling it a place of darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew eight twelve. It also says hell is a place of absolute hopeful, hopelessness, because God is absent from it, and those who go there will never experience heaven's joy, beauty, and peace. Its inhabitants will be shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. That's Second Thessalonians 1, verse 9. Not one word about hell in the Bible would ever make us want to go there. A seminary professor once said, Never preach about hell without tears in your eyes. Don't take hell lightly or talk yourself into believing it doesn't exist. It does. Life on earth has two paths, two doors, and two destinations. Choose only the path that leads to the door of heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, I am the gate, John 10, verse 9. And he also said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, Matthew four seventeen. He was thinking of you when he stepped out of heaven. He considered your soul when he went to the cross. Jesus cares for you as he looks down from heaven. Ask him to come into your heart 
so that you may dwell with him throughout eternity. Do we become angels when we die, as some think? Although this may be an intriguing thought, we do not become angels when we die. Angels are different from us, and in heaven that difference will be preserved. The holy angels are glorious spiritual beings under the command of God, but the gift of grace has been extended to the human race. God made provision for the salvation of fallen men, but he made no provision for the salvation of the fallen angels who rebelled against their creator and followed Lucifer or Satan. The holy angels, however, did not sin and they never lost their original glory or their relationship with God. This assures them of their exalted place in God's order and even now they serve God with great power. The Bible says they are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Hebrew 1.14 Jesus identified himself with fallen humanity when he was made a little lower than the angels. Hebrews 2 verse 9 Angels cannot testify of salvation by grace through faith, but they do exalt the one who stepped down from his throne of glory and onto the world's stage, humbling himself in the sight of the angelic host. The Bible says, Even angels long to look into these things. 1 Peter 1, 12. In heaven, those whose souls have been redeemed by the bloodshed of Christ will serve him with gladness and will in turn be served by God's holy angels. The angels will stand aside when believers are introduced to their boundless eternal riches. If you think about it, no sinner saved by grace would ever want to give up his exalted position in Christ by becoming an angel. The church is the body of Christ and it represents the highest expression of God's love. No love could go deeper or rise higher or extend farther than the amazing love that moved him to give his only begotten son to redeem the lost. And angels celebrate each one who is found. Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who, rep who repents. That's Luke 15, verse 10. What will we do in heaven? With your blood, you purchased men from God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. That's from Revelation verses, Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10. I'm, 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 having trouble because these headings like this one, what will we look like when we get to heaven? I don't know where, <laughs> I don't know where it's supposed to end this reading and the next one begins. I only have one word. What will we do in, oh, did I just do it? I did. What will we do in heaven? That's the start of the next reading. Oh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm going to go through and put the page number down so I can tell. I'm sorry I'm so bewildered. <laughs> this topic, topic is important for everyone in this world. I hope that you're listening. And maybe tell other people to listen too. I'll be back with What Will We Do in Heaven? <laughs> okay. Bye-bye now.